So, hi everyone, uh, my name is Emmanuel Vado, I'm manual at FreeBSD.org, and I'm going to talk uh, to you about how to port uh, FreeBSD on 64 on a new board, on a new SOC. So, first one, I'm, when I, uh, I'm a ham camera for two and a half years, this is when I've started to uh, do some drivers and port to a new SOC. I'm some self proclaimed maintenance for some stuff uh, arm related in, the, in FreeBSD, in the FreeBSD project. I'm one of the U-boot maintainer, and I'm uh, generally referred to the upstream guy to talk to Linux, who, uh, for which we share the DTS, which are files that are distributing hardware, and uh, also with the uh, U-boot guys. Uh, I'm going to briefly explain what ARM is, what uh, an SOC uh, system on chip is, what, uh, what a SBC single board computer is. We're going to see what's needed for a bootloader to be able to boot FreeBSD uh, properly without any pain. Uh, we are, we're going to see a little bit about the serial connection because you need a serial connection if you want to be able to debug something properly. Um, how to have the first kernel booting. And then we're going to talk about the clock and resets in SOC and the clock API in the FreeBSD project. So, yeah. Um, SOC means a uh, system on a chip, as I said. ARM does not manufacture a uh, processor. Uh, they sell IP, so for the core, for uh, some, um, some uh, GPIO controller, for uh, LCD controller, etc., to vendor. Uh, vendor buys IP from ARM, or, uh, from, uh, or they develop uh, some, uh, some of them themselves. Uh, they sometimes share some IP amongst uh, vendors, so you can find the same, for example, MMC controller in a Rockchip SOC or in a Samsung SOC. Uh, and an SOC integrates everything, uh, which is uh, the core, the processor itself, uh, and a lot of peripheral. So uh, HDMI, uh, HDMI stuff, uh, LVDS stuff, SD, uh, SDMMC, etc. A uh, single board computer uh, generated from another company uh, than the SOC one. Uh, there is a lot, uh, a lot of different uh, vendors in the market, uh, mainly, uh, mainly from China, from Shenzhen. Uh, and what a single board computer is, it, it integrates uh, SOC and some other chips, some RAM, some uh, HDMI Fi, uh, Ethernet connection, etc., onto a single PCB. Uh, the most popular example is the uh, Raspberry Pi. Uh, I'm pretty sure that if you, attend, uh, if you attend these talks, you know at least about uh, Raspberry Pi, even if, uh, if you didn't uh, use it already. Um, for this talk, I've based, uh, based it on my experience on how to port FreeBSD on the PAN64, Rock64. So this is a single board computer based on some uh, Rockchip uh, SOC, which is a Rockchip 3328. Uh, it got uh, gigabit Ethernet, it got USB 3, uh, eMMC socket for uh, fast access, etc. Uh, it was kindly donated by uh, Pine64 founder Thierry Lim. Uh, he already donated to me some, uh, some Pine books, and I should receive the, the uh, latest board uh, soon, which is the Rock Pro 64. So, big thanks to him. So, why porting to a new board? F first, it's fun. And yeah, you, you should have fun uh, while coding. Um, but also, uh, the main reason is you learn a lot uh, when you interact with hardware, uh, with a new hardware that you've never seen before. Uh, there is also some new ARM um, 64 board uh, out every month or so. Uh, having FreeBSD working on it is, I think, really important. There is a lot of um, complex stuff and crappery in the Linux embedded world. Uh, for FreeBSD, it's easier. You only have FreeBSD and that's all. In the Linux world, you have some things that we'll talk about a bit later. You have some vendor uh, fork for Linux. You have some Linux distributions that fork everything. So it's really complex. <laughs> Having something simple for an SBC, uh, you take an SD card image, you plug in, and what you have is just FreeBSD. It, it does not differ for FreeBSD from, uh, for IMD64, for example, uh, besides the architecture. And also, the reason I started that is that 
porting to a new arch is hard. But thankfully, ARM64 is already supported, and porting to a new SOC is not that, not that hard. You have, of course, some problem, but all the, the complex stuff is already done, thanks to Andrew. Uh, <laughs> uh, and yeah, you, you can have some really good results really quick. So, for ARM64, uh, we made the requirement to, for the bootloader to be EFI aware. So EFI, is, this is the same stuff that you have on your new uh, AMD64 computer, well, new, for some years now. Um, it simplifies a lot of stuff for us. Uh, on FreeBSD, we have our loader that we have for a long time. We love our loader, we need it. It sets uh, a lot of variable for us. Uh, so having EFI, mean, it, it means that we can simply use the loader EFI that we have. And uh, we don't have to deal with uh, all the, a lot of bold stuff or whatever. It's all, um, it's all simplified by the EFI interface. Um, you could probably boot with the FIT image. Uh, FIT is a flattened image tree. Uh, this is uh, an image that is described with the same language as the DTS. So DTS, uh, as I said, uh, some files that describe the hardware. Um, I've made some experiments uh, on it, mainly on ARM32. Uh, I was able to load uh, the loader, not the kernel, directly. Uh, so, yeah, uh, that's probably one way to boot FreeBSD on it. Um, Linux for ARM64 did some AH64 uh, Linux image type formats. Uh, so it's just a Linux kernel and there, there is some error or some offset, I don't remember where exactly, that describe where is the entry point, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We have some patch in review for that for FreeBSD. Uh, it can be useful because some bootloaders do not have EFI, uh, but have uh, this image support. Uh, I know some, some FreeBSD developers use it uh, to boot on the NVIDIA Tegra uh, because the NVIDIA Tegra bootloader is really old and do not have uh, EFI support. You could possibly convert uh, the kernel to a kernel.bin. This is something that we do automatically on uh, ARMv7 and ARMv6. Uh, so you could load the kernel and simply tell the bootloader to jump at uh, the address that you, uh, where you load the kernel. Uh, I don't use it, uh, but because mostly for every, uh, all the reasons I said before, you want something that's EFI aware, uh, it will really simplify uh, all your porting. Um, a little bit talk about how you boot. So you boot is a de facto standard bootloader for ARM. Uh, almost every board is using it. Uh, if you buy a cheap SBC board from China, uh, there is some, a lot of chance that it's, it's, it's using U boot as its main bootloader. So a little bit about U boot. Uh, mainline U boot release uh, a stable release every two months. Uh, it's the same it's like, uh, like the Linux kernel. Uh, the SOC vendor usually pick a release or random commit at some point when they start to port U-Boot to their new SOC. And what they do is they stay on it and they patch it. So I was talking about the NVIDIA U-Boot. Uh, I think they are still using something from 2015 uh, with a lot of patches. So, yeah. But something worse is that the Single board computer vendor takes the vendor, takes the SOC vendor U boot, they patch it for the board, and they stay on it. And even worse, the Linux distribution takes the SBC vendor U boot, patch it because they need to change some stuff, and never upstream anything. For Rockchip, mainline still release every two months. Rockchip fork is based on uh, 2017 or 9, so back in September, which is okay, which is good for us because this, uh, this release supports EFI to some extent. As I said, they stay on it and they patch it. They have a lot of patch on top of this release. They do upstream some of the patches. Uh, 
but they don't have uh, like something like a working branch with all the patch already uh, merged and uh, updated to upstream. So I'm sure there is some magic git command where you can compare all the branches or whatever. But yeah, it's easier to use uh, uh, their, vendor, uh, their vendor fork. Um, for Rockchip, there is a few patches uh, from the Pine64 guys. Of course, not, none of them have been upstream. Uh, that is upstream either to uh, U-Boot mainline or to the U-Boot from Rockchip. And the Linux distribution, uh, the community Linux distribution for Pine64, Rock64, they have something like 100 patches. Um, they don't want to upstream anything. I've asked the maintainer, uh, did, he, did, he, did he have any plan to update uh, the U-boot be, because I, ha I had some EFI problem? And he said, no, I'm using uh, the fork from Workchip and I, I'll stay on it. So you have, we have to wait uh, for Workchip to update its U-boot. I've tried to look how often they do that. I didn't find anything. Hopefully, they'll do, they do that every year. So in next September, we have uh, an updated U-boot, but I'm not really sure about that. Uh, when I started to use my Rock64, I used the uh, vendor U-Boot Pluralized one. So I've simply downloaded their SD card image, burned the SD card image on a SD card, and boot. I saw that it was based, as I say, on the 2017 version. I said, okay, cool, it has a EFI support, so I could be able to use it properly. Um, I've switched quickly to the community build by uh, some guy named Ayufan, uh, simply because it was more active, uh, and he fixed uh, netboot support, so having netboot when you, uh, when you are porting to a new board is really, really useful. Uh, swapping SD card uh, back and forth from your, from your uh, computer and the board is really boring, so I switched to that. Um, what the guy did is cool because since the board has a SPI flash on board, uh, he simply made a SD card image uh, that you put on your uh, Rock64. It flashes the same U boot on the SPI flash, and then you don't have to deal with SD card at all. So you can do whatever you want. It will always the board will always boot from the SPI flash. Uh, you can always recover because it boots first from the SD card, but you can use the SD card uh, inside to. Uh, do some DD tests when you are uh, porting uh, the MMC controller or whatever. You don't have to care about keeping your boots at the offset to boots uh, next time. And as I said, it supports CFTP boots. Uh, some other FreeBSD committer, Andreas, uh, updated your boot from uh, IUFAN, uh, at least the EFI part. Uh, I have not tested his work yet, but I know that now he can uh, boot off um, USB disk, uh, something that I couldn't do uh, with uh, stock U-boot uh, from IOFAN. So I need to test that and do something about it, maybe provide a port for FreeBSD or whatever. Uh, booting of USB disk would be very, very useful. So, a little bit about the serial. Uh, I'm talking about that because the first time I tried to boot FreeBSD on the board, so that was loading the EFI loader, uh, from the EFI loader loading the kernel, and I just tapped boot, I had nothing on the, um, on the UART. Uh, the FreeBSD kernel tried to resolve the serial from some node in the DTS, so this is slash chosen slash std i and std out. It falls back on some node named uh, serial zero, and of course the node needs to be something else that disabled. And of course the U-boot from uh, the Rock64 didn't have the serial enabled. After uh, changing the, 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 the DTB uh, and refresh it on the, on the SD card, I was able to boot and have serial booting. I have a, a serial console. Uh, there is a really good chance that your serial controller is already supported by FreeBSD. Uh, I don't know, I don't have a number on how much we do support, but um, there, there is not a lot uh, out there in the wild. Uh, so, yeah. 
So for, for the first boot, as I said, being, being able to load, load our EFI, having some UART console, will mean that you will boot. ARM64 simplify a lot of stuff, and uh, while uh, from, from, you know, from the world of uh, ARMv6 or ARMv7, you could have different core um, made by other companies at ARM that didn't buy the IP from ARM, but just the right to implement a new core. On ARM64, all the core are made from ARM. Uh, I'm sure some guy, some company one day will make their own, but um, uh, right now, every core is mostly supported by FreeBSD. We can have some KMAT on some, on some of them, but uh, it simplifies also a lot of the booting uh, mechanism and uh, all the AP startup, so auxiliary processor, uh, something, it's something now standardized, uh, whereas on MV6, MV7, it will depend on the SOC. So right now, if you have EFI, it will mean that you will boot. Using an MFS route uh, while you are developing the, the, the driver for the Ethernet controller is very handy. Uh, you cannot NFS route if you, uh, if you don't have a, an Ethernet controller, of course. Um, we don't currently provide some scripts in the FreeBSD source tree to create some MFS routes. We talked a bit about it uh, during the Dev Summit. Uh, that might be something that we should do because everyone <coughs> have their own scripts that they did. Uh, maybe we could, we could share every, every circuit source from everybody and do something or something that creates some really small MFS routes. So if you have kernel booting, you will of course have no driver, or maybe you have, maybe you have some, some driver, but most of, the, most of them will, uh, will not be supported. Most of the device will not be supported, so you can, have, you can start Right device driver. Well, not really, because you need to handle clocks and reset support first. I will switch about the, how all the clocks are handled in a general way uh, in an ARM SOC. Uh, so if everybody has a question from the first part. Yeah, one there. Yeah. Uh, would it be what? Oh, are you? Um, you said you might provide a port for that. Yeah. Uh, I don't know yet. The the, re the, the reason I the, the reason I didn't submit a port for the Rock City Four yet is that the situation is so bad that I don't know. I, I, I basically don't know what to do. Uh, I want to do some proper stuff. Uh, we, the thing is that you, you boot for Rockchip also need some binary uh, blobs provided by Rockchip. Uh, those are the DRAM controller and some other shit. Uh, you also need the uh, ATS, the untrusted framework. Um, we have already a port for the all winner SOC, but we need a generic one. I have it. Uh, on my machine at home, I didn't submit anything because I didn't make a U-boot port, so submitting a port unused was, uh, yeah, was not needed, uh, so I don't know. But yeah, I, 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 want, I, want, uh, I want the U-boot port to use uh, the U-boot master uh, port, but we need to upstream some stuff first uh, to be able to boot. It's complicated then, right? Right. Yes, Peter. <laughs> Oh, really? Like U boot is slow and complicated for upstreaming those patches. Well, it depends. It, it depends. It depends. Some of them are really fast, some of them are really slow. Yeah. So the community itself is trying to upstream as much as possible. Okay, I didn't know about that. Until then, a separate port may be the least worst of your options. Yeah. I'll just, I, I would just put U boot on my people.freebasy.org uh, U boot image and people can use it uh, in the meantime. Yes, Andrew? Just confirm when it comes to device tree. Yeah. Uh, you engage in the device tree locations and then you can see what the device tree is. No, in, in, in what way?
Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> And so I think it would be really useful for them and for FreeBSD uh, and everyone in general really that you guys are able to provide your input as to how you think things should go and you know the Linux guys may come up with some crazy ass idea as to how they think it should happen and it just causes you more headache. Yeah, it is. Yeah, well, it, it's it's not really a matter of specs. I mean, we can handle GTB uh, something, but sometimes the, you, the DTS guy from Linux just put some quicks or describes hardware that is only possible to handle the, like that in Linux uh, because they don't have the same restrictions as us. Um, yeah, but yeah, Rana. Yeah, from, from time to time, someone is talking about uh, exporting the DTS from the Linux repository to a common repository, but yeah, we'll see in the future. So we know about it and we're trying. So, on to the clocks now. Um, so I, I don't know how, how other Arch is working, but on most ARM SOC, you can control every clock. That is the uh, main clocks, the CPU clocks, the SDMMC controller clock, Ethernet controller clock, etc. Uh, what I'm going to say is pretty generic. Uh, it should apply in, on more, for most SOC. So usually you have a 24 megahertz oscillator on the board. Uh, the fact that it's 24 is because you can have some nice multiple of it. Um, and the SOC from this 24 megahertz oscillator derives some PLL. So PLL, them, uh, it means a phase lock loop. Uh, it's just uh, electronic circuitry that uh, feeds its input, uh, its output to, the, to its input, and you can generate a high, uh, higher frequencies at the source. Um, for the rock chip um, RK3328, it has six PLL, if I recall correctly. Um, the peripheral clock, so as MMC, uh, Ethernet, or whatever, uh, derives a frequency from some PLL. Um, they us usually can choose between multiple parents. Uh, this is because sometimes you need to uh, change the frequency of the parent to have the correct one uh, for the child. Uh, like if you want um, uh, 52 megahertz for the uh, MMC controller because it's running at, th at this speed uh, in high speed mode. Uh, you sometimes need to adjust the parent to be able to set the correct frequency for the child. Each SOC is different. Uh, you won't find any clock that looks like another clock in another vendor SOC. But most of the time, the vendor of SOC reuse the clock model between SOC. Uh, this means that the work I've done on supporting the clock in the Rockchip 3328 uh, could and will be used uh, for the Rockchip 3399, which is another SOC from Rockchip. Uh, reset just activate deactivate the peripheral. Uh, Every peripheral that you don't use, you need to uh, you need to deactivate them, so they don't uh, draw any current. Uh, so if you're running from battery, you have more battery, etc. It's usually just one bit in one register. You set one to uh, deactivate the peripheral. You set it to zero to activate it, or the other way around. It's really something easy. So to manage clock, you can have multiple uh, solution. One solution is make some function like that, so rock chip uh, 3328, uh, clock, blah, uh, the frequency and a bool to enable, disable. It works. Uh, most of our ARM ports uh, done in five or seven years ago use something like that. Uh, but it means a lot of 
if else in the driver code. Like I said, drivers are usually shared amongst SOC. Um, for example, the SD controller on rock chip is used on uh, the Samsung clock. So you need to, do, to say, OK, if I'm running on a rock chip, I will call this function. If I'm running on Exynos, should you, you, I need to call this function, etc. And you don't have a generic way to uh, manage clock, uh, the clock parent relationship. Um, you need to be able to change parent if needed, uh, to change the frequency easily, etc. Uh, and having some hard coded function for SOC is not really great. And you don't really reuse code between SOC. Um, probably the rock chip uh, 3399 uses the same SD clock like the previous one. So you could just reuse the function, make a generic rock chip function, but then in a future SOC you will have some little difference, etc. So yeah, it's not really good to, to do stuff like that. The right way is to use the clock API that we have on FreeBSD. Uh, the clock API first appeared in FreeBSD 11. Uh, it was done by uh, MLS FreeBSD, uh, Michel Melun. Currently, it's used for NVIDIA Tegra. This was uh, guinea pig uh, from ML. Uh, we port it to all winner uh, a while ago now, and now I'm using it for the Rockship SOCs. Um, so basically, the clock, dri a clock driver re register a clock. Uh, drivers then can uh, enable, disable, and change the clock frequency uh, in a SOC independent way. The only caveat about uh, this clock API is that uh, ML never submitted any man pages. Uh, I've been willing to write, uh, to write some for quite some time now. I really need to do it, I know, <laughs> because it's really very, very wrong to, to not have a main page for this new, uh, new API. But yeah, in the meantime, I think that this presentation will be the, the most documentation that you will find uh, out there. Well, of course, code. Code is documentation, right? <laughs> um, so the API can handle some basic clock type. Um, you can have some fixed clock. This is either a uh, fixed frequency, so like the 24 MHz quartz, uh, quartz oscillators I was talking about, or it's just a, a child of another clock with a static multiplier of divider. So sometimes you will find some uh, uh, 38, uh, 48 MHz uh, frequency in the SOC. This is just a fixed clock uh, uh, with 24 MHz parent and a multiplier of two. You have some Clock div support, so it supports fractional divider and uh, also divider table. This is something really common in most of the SOC, so having, having, uh, having support like that in the API is useful. And you have the CLK MUX uh, type, which is a sim uh, simple multiple parents from a clock. Sometimes a clock uh, do not change the frequency of its parent, but just inherited it, but it can have multiple parents. So the clock mux type is a way to represent it. But all SOC specific clock needs to be created. This is on purpose. Um, as I say, every SOC is different. We cannot have in the tree a generic way to represent every clock out there. We could if, we, if we're doing something very ugly, probably, but it's not what we want to do. So to create a clock type, you just need to subclass the clock node class. Uh, you can see clock node uh, underscore if.m for that. There is a few methods uh, that a clock needs to handle or can handle. The clock in it, uh, it's, doing, it's just called doing uh, the clock registration, and it truly needs a parent if the clock has any parent. The set gate enable or disable the clock simply. The set mux will switch the parents if the clock has support for that, of course. The recalc uh, refresh the cache value of the clock. So the clock API uh, is caching every frequency. And when you are changing clock, like changing a clock parent or changing a clock frequency, it recalls the recalc one. Uh, what this function should do is simply read the register in the SOC uh, and recalculate the frequency about that. It's useful because if you made a mistake, 
in the next function, which is uh, set fresh, you will know uh, very quickly that you made a mistake because you wouldn't have the same value uh, that you passed to set fresh uh, from the ones that you received from clock recalc. So to create a clock unit driver, it's a simple uh, device driver. Uh, you need to create a clock domain with clock dom creates. You create some clock node with clock node creates. You re register it with the uh, register method. You repeat that for every clock on your SOC that choose your port. And you finish the clock domain with clock dom finite. Um, a clock do Every, you, you can have, for example, multiple uh, clock unit driver on the SOC. So each of them will have a separate clock domain. Uh, is, uh, there is some relation. Uh, you could have some relation, like you could have some parents in another clock domain for another clock, etc. So you need to do things in order. Um, you need to use a clock set assigned to pass the ascent clock property. I will show some example uh, from that. Uh, this is something that I forgot to do for a long time for the Rock 64, and the thing is, uh, U-Boot uh, set the CPU clock to 200 megahertz. I was wondering why the Rock 64 was so slow for a long time uh, until I uh, uh, I see uh, I saw the DTS that there was some ice and clock uh, stuff uh, which set the clock to uh, 600 megahertz. This is not the max that it can do, but at least it's better than 200 megahertz. So, it can be a little bit scary, this thing. Um, this is usually uh, what you found in some device tree. You have some uh, as clock property with some reference to some clock. So a clock is a reference with uh, simple define, like everything else you see, like the, the first one, the DCLK underscore LC, uh, LCDC, in, it's, simple, uh, the, it's simply a define that you will reuse in your clock uh, driver. And you will find two other properties, which is assign clock parent. Uh, this means that, for example, the HDMI file, which is the first one of the assign clock parent, um, is supposed to be the parent of the first one of the ascent and clock table. And you have the ascent and clock rate uh, later. For, uh, at the same offset, you find a value of zero. This means don't change the frequency. But if you take the second one, which is something like 600 megahertz or whatever, this means you need to set the frequency uh, uh, at that rate for the SCLK, SCLK PDM, and also set the parent to the PLL underscore APLL. It's a bit complicated to understand at first, but you don't have to worry about that because uh, the clock set assign function does everything, does everything for you. There might be still some bugs because I've coded it quite quickly and tested only on two or three SRC, but yeah, it should work out of the box without problem. Um, as I said, you also need to handle resets. To reset a clock provider, usually it's the same device as a clock unit. You have two new dev methods, HW assert, uh, reset assert, and is asserted. The first one, assert or deassert uh, the reset for the, for the module. And the latest one, just test if uh, the module is asserted. And you all need to, you just need to uh, register yourself as a reset provider using this function. So to use a clock in a, in a driver, um, the, the, the good thing about clock is that they are standardized. Uh, for, for, the, for some MMC driver, you will find that it will have two clocks, for example. For, on the rock chip, it's, they, they are named CUI clock and BUI clock. And this SD uh, controller, as I said, is based on a uh, designware IP. And that means that every designware IP uh, based controller are using these two clocks. So the driver for the rock chip needs to handle the clock in a generic way, the same way as, uh, as on the uh, Exynos, for example, which is also using this controller. 
So you simply uh, get the clock either by name or either by index. The index was what I was talking about uh, and uh, what I shown in the example of the ascent clock. You obtain a CLK underscore T object and you can enable, disable it. You can set a get sub frequency uh, and you freeze the clock using CLK release. Um, I always take the SDMMC example because this is something where you need to change the frequency a lot. You need to set it to uh, 400 kilohertz to discover the card. Uh, then you have some different speed of SD or MMC. You, have, you can have the clock at 25 megahertz, at 50 megahertz, 52 megahertz, etc., up to 200 megahertz. So this is something that you really need to handle to have MMC working correctly. At a right, uh, a correct rate. A few advice: uh, start with a few clocks, like mandatory PLL, HB clocks, etc. Do not handle the set track method at first. Just go easy. Uh, some people want to go and implement all the clocks on the SOC. Uh, I've started to do that. I've deleted everything, uh, restarted from scratch, just adding a few clocks at a time and compiling and booting the kernel. It's very easy to make some mistakes. It's also very easy to read the mistakes that exist in the documentation from the vendor. Uh, there is a lot. Uh, you need to do a lot of checking. There is a function that you can use, it clock down dump. Just after you clock them, finish, it will simply print, print on, the, uh, on, the, on the serial console every clock with their current parents and their frequencies. I've added uh, hw.clockcctl. It can uh, it dump all the clocks with, uh, with the current parents, all the possible parents, the frequency, the child, etc. This is very useful uh, to debug stuff. Uh, I've made a script a while ago to convert that to a graph using uh, graphies. Uh, I've un unfortunately lost the script, uh, but yeah, I, I need to make, it, uh, to make it again and commit it somewhere. Uh, it can create some nice graphic with all the clock dependency, etc. And make sure that your clock is really working and that it's not a bootloader leftover. Sometimes you think that, okay, my clock is working, it said that the right frequency, but no, it's just that you 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 wrote something something uh, you wrote uh, elsewhere, and it's just that the bootloader did the right job. So make sure when you are implementing the set frec method to read the register before, write it, read it again, compare with the documentation, etc. So now you can write device driver. Uh, I will not talk about that because it's mostly boring. Uh, but just a few advice, uh, as I say, there is a lot of reuse, so check if some driver uh, doesn't already exist, even if you have to adapt a bit. And beware of the docs. Uh, the reason I say that one, month, one more time is that last weekend I spent, uh, well, the whole weekend, to try to implement the i squared t controller on the ROG64. I got receiving working fairly easily, like in two hours, and I've, spe I've spent, I don't know, something like 10 hours trying to figure out why TAX, so transmit, was not working. At one point, I decided to look at the Linux source code. The Linux source code, uh, so the the i squared c controller is the same in the Rockchip SOC for something like 10 years. The driver in Linux didn't really change, and I found that the mode that I was, that I was trying to use is broken. It's written in the driver, uh, in the Linux driver, of course, but in the doc from the latest SOC, it's still broken, and it's not written that it's broken. So. I've lost a lot of time on that, so beware of docs. Sometimes you need to read some Linux driver. That's all for me. Uh, if you have any question, I'm happy to answer that. Yes, Brad. Do you want to write about 
page, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mendoc is not a problem. It's just watching the stuff. Uh, I, 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 I can write. Uh, I, I do write some mind page. Uh, but yeah, descri describing describing everything like that. Uh, I need to be very careful, and so it's not something that I can do between two beers. You see? Yeah. Yes, Nick. Do you have any? Do you have anything written up anywhere of going from source code to booting? Compile generic kernel. Set up a netboot, uh, netboot environment. Okay. And you're good. You're good to go. Oh. TF, so loader the TFI on the TFTP server. Okay. Uh, and yeah, loader EFI downloaded by U-boot. Loader EFI is downloading uh, the kernel, and you're good to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No more question? Yeah. How do you this this is sort of what we talked about? How do you handle it when two different ports, for example, this is a next thing for a chip. A what? A next thing company chip. Ah, it's a chip, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it uses the same uh, SOC and the same power management IC as the cookie board, but the IO is different. Um, so uh, it is no, it's not the same. This is uh, R8, R8, yeah. so it's a uh, for thin, and QB board is using either A10 or A20. Yeah. So, like, here's, here's, here's the thing. So, for example, the Wi Fi is SDIO, yeah. yeah. but its power management goes through the, like, it's usually GCIO from the power management IC. So, it's. Uh, no, it's got some AXP something, so it's just I2C. Okay. How do you handle that? This is something that will be described uh, in the DTS. Okay. So if your driver that need to handle that uh, pass correctly the DTS, you won't have any problem. Oh, okay. Cool. So it just work out of the box if you made the proper code. Okay. Yeah. Also pin max. Also pin max. Yeah. Yeah. Because you you don't have ev you you don't have. Uh, a big amount of pins on, on SOC for the number of virtual pins, so you need to handle pin marks properly. Uh, this is one of the first things that you should do, the, the first driver that you should do after you have some clock, pin marks, GPIO. So the way the hardware works is the SPI controls where do I find you? And that knows the name of the board, which is a, which is a string that matches in the DTS. Either it has a full U-boot that can do EFI, or it has just enough to go. Like, I look at this sector on the disk and pull it, but it has just enough to pull the data. And either it provides the DTS in the SPI, or it knows I can look on the U-boot disk for these files and then look at it. No more question? Okay, thank you.